let's think about the near future, not the distant future where everyone will be driving around in flying cars and virtual reality will be the only reality that we have. But let's think about the future that's sort of coming down the pipeline a lot faster than we might expect. To talk about this, we've got a great panel of VCs here, and they're going to talk to us about what tech will be like in 2020. And if you can do the math, that's in just five years' time. I want to get this conversation going by um, talking to Albert, and I want to ask you this question, you know, and it's on a lot of people's minds here at the conference, and it's, can this great ride that tech has been having continue unabated into 2020? Well. If by the march of technology you mean valuations, uh, they could change at a moment's notice. There are many external factors that could lead to a correction there any time. But if you mean by the march of technology, the impact of technology on our lives, I think it's only going to accelerate from here on out. Right, and Lude, I want to put this question to you directly. And it's a question, again, that a lot of entrepreneurs and investors are thinking about. Are we in a bubble? <laughs> So uh, I think the term bubble is, is something that's misunderstood because it's always referenced to previous bubbles that we've had. Um, and I think uh, whatever environment that we're in, which is certainly exuberant from a valuation perspective, I think it's a lot different from what happened in 2008, 2009, a lot different from what happened in 1999, 2000. How, how are they different? Maybe we could talk through each of them. So 99, 2000, first of all, uh, you had um, an overvalued public market and you had um, the, the, the uh, uh, sort of infrastructure of internet technology happening in a way that no one really understood it. No one really understood what, what are sources of durable value, what are sources of sort of flash in the pan value. So the underlying sustainability of those business models was really in question. Fast forward 15 years later, the market, the investor landscape, the, the landscape of, of talent that's fueling these companies, the ecosystem around these companies, it's much more mature, uh, and, and therefore the, the ecosystem is more uh, sustainable, is more durable, and the quality of companies is a lot better. So that differentiates sort of the crop of companies today versus the crop of companies in 99 and why that's fundamentally different. Secondly, right now, the public markets are fairly valued. I think by any measurement, you don't have a public market valuation bubble. Right? And then in, in 2008, you sort of had a financial system crisis meltdown that then uh, led to the impact, obviously, in, in financing private companies. Today's exuberance, if you will, is not a public market situation, so you don't have to worry, is there an opportunity for these companies to get out? Um, I don't think it's an early stage valuation problem either, because if you look at sort of the volume of companies that are getting financed, um, you look at the IPO volumes, those are kind of uh, pretty healthy in terms of just sort of the history of those volumes. What's happened is there's a lot of growth financing happening, and that pool of capital is in such abundance that it's creating exuberance and companies that are raising really large rounds, such competition there that, uh, that there are growth rounds being raised at growth stage valuations that are assuming venture risk. Right. Um, so I think today what's happening is a lot greater risk is being undertaken at much higher valuations and much higher check sizes um, in that uh, growth stage valuation class. Right, and Christine, I, yeah, yeah. When I've talked about that with people, I, I'm a simple person, so I say the simple phrase for me is, I think in the 1999-2000 bubble, that was when my grandma's money was the one that was at risk, and she was the one, because she went and bought stock on the public market, and she's the one who would have lost stock, including some companies I worked at. Um, and, then, uh, and then today, it's really our capital that's at risk. So it's our limited partners that invest in venture funds versus a consumer. So I think if this bubble pops, many fewer people get affected in a very personal level than in the prior one. Right, no, and, and I'm glad that Mood is the one who's running the growth fund, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the thing is that all technologies follow this pattern, right? Mm -hmm. uh, almost every technology you get at early bubble in the stock market, that was true for railroads, that was true for cars, and then you get this long phase afterwards where the real changes that this technology brings about actually play themselves out, and that's the phase we're now in. Right, I want, I want to start looking forward a little bit too, and Christine, maybe we could have you weigh in here. What, five years from now, who will be the big players in tech? Who will be the big companies? 
Right. Well, I will, of course, have to say Intel because, well, I'm paid <laughs> to say that as well as uh, we do have some fun things coming. Um, but uh, if you look at where a lot of innovation is happening, it, it's becoming smaller and more personal. And so that might mean something that's in your home. It might mean something that's on your body. Um, it might mean something that it's actually inside of you. I mean, I've even seen people with sensors inside of pills, right? So you actually digest the pill and it knows exactly when you took it and how it's being dissolved and absorbed and whatnot. So there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on um, that uh, gets smaller and more personal. And I think that's something that will affect all of us in ways we certainly don't you know, see all of yet. Right. I also want to know, you know, what will Silicon Valley look like in 2020? I mean, one of the huge issues that we hear about time and time again is a lack of diversity. The Wall Street Journal published a report this year about women in the workplace, and it's mm -hmm. talked about a lot about the diversity issues in Silicon Valley and tech at large. I mean, Albert, why don't we go to you? What will it take to make tech more diverse? Well, one mm. of the things it will take is not looking at Silicon Valley all the time. I mean, Look at this, this is Europe, and there are startups all around the world, and there's diversity that's coming from people starting companies in different places with different cultures. And so I think if we ask what will Silicon Valley look like, we should look at what will Europe look like, what will Asia look like. Um, there are lots of centers of innovation that are doing interesting things with interesting, diverse group of people. I want to talk about countries. We sort of talked about internationalism. And Mood, maybe we go to you on this. You know, what country five years from now will be playing the largest role in terms of innovation? Well, is it the United States now, and will it continue to be in the future, or will, it be, will, will, will there be other challengers? Um, so there's, there's no doubt, just as d diversity is um, inevitable, it, that, that, that our um, tech landscape is going to become more diverse. Because, and I'm speaking strictly for consumer companies, you need to empathize with your audience, with your consumers. And it's an incredibly diverse environment of consumers. And if you, as a developer of products, don't empathize with diverse consumers, whether um, it's by, by sex, whether it's by race, you're doomed to fail. And I think um, uh, sort of the same is true in terms of where companies are going to evolve. Uh, you know, it's a more international environment. And I think it's inevitable that um, the things are going to move a little bit away from the concentration of Silicon Valley. That said, to answer your first question, will it still be concentrated in Silicon Valley? Absolutely. And there are reasons for that that have to do with the ecosystem of companies that are there mm -hmm. that then produce uh, future yeah. cohorts of talent. Um, and I think it's going to be hard in the next 10 years, at least, to, uh, to sort of uh, unseat that. Yeah, and I don't think it's, and, and frankly, and uh, you know, I'll do the, well, I should speak on diversity. Uh, you know, but I've been in venture capital since 1992, on and off, back and forth to the operating side. And I can tell you, it is better. It is not that much better. So people talk about 4% women uh, on the venture side. Right. Um, that is about exactly the same as 1992 when I had my first venture job. I mean, yeah, realistically, <laughs> what's it going to take then? Is it going to take an educational change? Yeah, and, and I think part of it has to do with discomfort with difference. And so I spent some time with Omidyar Network, uh, which is the eBay Founders Investments uh, Group. And it was interesting, we didn't seek out women to invest in, but since there were so many women on the investment team, just naturally people felt comfortable with more diversity in the room. So, you know, much of the time when you're an investor, you want to invest in someone that feels comfortable to you, that the chemistry is good, you trust what they're saying, you want to hang out with them on the weekends, um, you want to talk to them at two in the morning when the servers are on fire. And, uh, and sometimes that's going to end up being someone that looks just like you. And so if you're used to a different set of people in the room, you will be comfortable with a different set of people at 2 in the morning. Right. For the entrepreneurs in the audience who have been pitching all week, kudos to you. Um, I also want to ask Albert, maybe we can go to this question, how will the pitch change in the next five years? Will startups be coming to VCs, presenting you know, slide decks, and you know, asking for capital in that way? Or will things change? Well, the transformation that has already happened is phenomenal. I mean, venture capital used to be a completely clubby industry. You had to know somebody to know somebody to get an introduction. Today, you can reach most VCs on Twitter via the direct email, um, the blog. And so that's already been a huge shift. And then you add to that all these new access platforms, whether it's AngelList or CircleUp or um, things like YC that are, you know, putting through many more companies, uh, lots of crowdfunding, things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo. 
I think we're entering a fantastic world for startups where the cost has come way down to start something through you know, Amazon and so forth, and the access to capital is way more transparent than ever, which is why it's so thrilling to see so many startups um, right. emerge. But I mean, as a VC, does that worry you? I mean, do you ever feel like crowdfunding is sort of eating the VC yeah. lunch? Well, I, I think it's certainly changing. I, mean, I know when, again, sort of looking back you know, 15, 20 years ago, people wrote business plans and sent them in, and, and we might actually have read them. And I can't remember Not the really. last time. <laughs> when was the last time you read a business plan that someone sent to you, right? So now you might get a slide deck or a blurb, or maybe you'll look at their angel list page uh, because it's so easy, because it's the same form for every single company. Um, and so I do see uh, the role of venture capitalists changing, certainly on the earlier side, because you have things like angel list syndicates and many other paths to get that initial funding up and running. Um, when I was at first round, uh, one of the things Josh Koppelman all, often said was, the seed round was a way to have optionality around your Series A. You could take the local instead of the express for the outcome for your business. I think since then, people have now started treating the seed round as a stepping stone to the A. It is no longer optionality around the A. So now, does that mean that optionality comes from your Angelist Syndicate or on Funders Club or one of these other crowdfunding platforms? Um, does it mean you work with a micro fund? You know, I'm speaking to diversity, I know 500 Startups has um, these micro funds around the world. So there's one for India, there's one for China and so forth um, that feed into the main fund, right? So you see all these interesting different paths to the bigger pot of capital happening which I think democratizes it quite a bit. Right, and Nud, I want so, your thoughts so too. I, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just, it also goes to the earlier diversity question, which is um, I think because there's easier access to capital, more diverse types of companies and diverse groups of founders are finding access to capital. So yeah. I think that's a good, good development. There is the question of governance. So you still want people on your board of directors who have experience with startups, who have experience with the governance of startups, because inevitably things go wrong, and it's when things go wrong that you need governance. If things never went wrong, you didn't, wouldn't need right. governance. Mood, I want you to weigh in here too. Is your job going to be the same in 2020? Um, well, I think um, uh, they just cover the right themes as far as early stage in investing goes, and that is probably where the overlap with crowdfunding is going to happen the most. Uh, whereas growth stage investing, I think the, the sort of transformation has already happened for me, meaning um, I think our industry broadly 20 years ago had a sense of entitlement about people sleeping on our doorsteps to try to get us to take a meeting, to try to get us to give them capital because capital was scarce. Uh, for the asset class that I'm focused on, which are companies that are already doing very well, looking to raise a large round of financing, these companies aren't sleeping on anybody's doorsteps. So it's really incumbent upon us as growth stage investors to find them. So I am, if I'm in the office all the time, I'm not doing my job. Um, if I'm waiting for someone to produce a business plan and give it to me, it means they're not focused on what they need to be doing, which is running the business. So I never see business plans. I rarely see PowerPoint decks. Mm -hmm. I'm there to ask, hopefully, smart questions and a focused amount of time to, uh, to understand the vital signs of the business to then make that determination whether we can add value and whether it's a good investment. I want to get to a conversation that we've been having quite a bit here at Web Summit, and it's over email. There have been a number of panels addressing this idea that, you know, in, in, soon email, if not already, will be dead. I want the three of you to weigh in on this. It seems like a light question, but it gets at a fundamental way about how we communicate and about how we sort of connect with each other. So I want to go to each of you. Christine, maybe we'll start. Is email going to be dead by the time we get to 2020? No. Why not? Like, nice clean answer. Uh, well, it's interesting. They have some research uh, that's come out around marketing communications and how people are engaging from a marketing point of view. And email is number one for mobile. That is how people communicate. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily where collaboration will occur, because a lot of collaboration right now is in email. It's this to-do list that you didn't write, right? Some right. just throw piles of crap at you, and you have to deal with it. Um, so that's when you look at things like Slack or these other sort of short form communication channels. I would love if all my collaboration could be done in 140 characters and I don't have to talk to people. That would be great. But, um, Robert, what about you? Is email going to be dead yeah. in five years? Is email going to be dead in five years? Uh, I, I think the best prediction for how long something will be around is how long it's been around. Email's been around for a long time. I think it's going to be around for quite a long yeah. time. Um, it's, ubiquitous and it's uh, addressable to everybody. They don't need to be on some system. It's based on an open standard and those things mm -hmm. are very hard to displace. It doesn't mean it'll be around forever, but they're very hard to displace. And Mood, I um, want your thoughts too. Um, look, it's a, it's a long format uh, to, to, to communicate with someone. And uh, you know, I probably read my email uh, three times a day and it's flooded and it's hard you know, to, to get 
people's attention mm -hmm. on email. So I, I think it will exist, it will have its place for a particular format of communication. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I think messaging broadly is going to be way more profound um, 10 years from now mm -hmm. than it is today, but I think it's going to be more fragmented. Within the enterprise, things like Slack are going to be more dominant. Um, obviously, text messaging and WhatsApp. Internationally, when I travel, WhatsApp is the lifeblood for all communications. It's unbelievable. It replaces email, it replaces everything. Um, and I think it's, you know, Facebook Messenger, Twitter, obviously getting messaged there, it has its own niche. So I think all these things are going to have their place. Email will be one of them. It'll be less relevant than it is today, but I think it'll still be around. Right. I want to ask a question again for the entrepreneurs in the audience who are sort of thinking five years ahead and thinking about how they can sort of <coughs> latch themselves onto these big macro trends and, you know, maybe move from the, the booths that we've seen all around the summit to being on the stage in five years. What one tip would you give that entrepreneur who's in the audience right now who, who really just wants to propel forward? Christine. Gosh, uh, my, my standard advice for a seed stage entrepreneur is uh, if you want to get off the ground and you know, get to the next level, there are three things I care about. And mar the market size is actually not one of them. Uh, I care about the team, I care about your product, and I care about your customer acquisition. Um, there are so many great products that you just can't find people to use. And that's you know, not necessarily because you don't know who has the problem, but you, know, you just don't have a way to get to them. So if people can sort those three things out, I think that's the best way to get to the next stage. And that's, you know, if you can't get there, you're not gonna get five years out. Yeah, Albert, tip. Uh, two pieces of advice. The first one, it's not the million things that you could be doing. There's only ever one thing holding you back from getting to the next level of your startup. Identify what the one thing is that's holding you back. Um, second thing, as your startup grows, you have to grow as a person or you will not succeed. Mm. Mood. Uh, I would say, and it's consistent with what Al, uh, Albert said, I think uh, focus on that one killer thing. So be simple in, in the problem that you're trying to solve. And when you nail that, it's like lightning in the bottle. And then adding features and functionality and scaling the business, it should follow in sequence from that. So Facebook focused very early on voyeurism in college. Snapchat actually probably started out being uh, high school sexting. You know, which exploded, and then it is, has become what it is today. So focus on that first thing, then scale. And the second thing I would say is, which is similar to this, walk before you run. There's some great ideas that try to move too quickly and then stumble, and if they've just digested um, their, their phases of, of evolution, I think, in a more di digestible manner, I think they would have succeeded. I think that's a good uh, place to end. Christine, Albert, and Mood, thank you so much. And Web Summit, thank you, and congratulations. Mm -hmm.